The geopolitical strategist who predicted a Russian coup reveals the market calls he's making next. When policymakers do something against their material constraints, their, their time in power is doomed. So I'm not too excited about China. I just think China will not be suicidal. But a bigger picture for me is emerging markets. It's Monday the 18th of September and you're watching Markets with Madison. Disregard politicians and US-China tensions and look for value in the emerging markets. That's the take from Marco Papich, the author of Geopolitical Alpha. He's the strategist who predicted a Russian coup attempt and as a result successfully shorted commodities like oil and wheat. So what's he watching now and how does he turn major global events into correct market calls? We had a chat when he landed back in LA from South Africa last week. And just a warning, the audio from the Zoom interview isn't great, but I promise he's worth listening to. Marco, thank you so much for your time. It's great to chat with you. Thank you for having me, Madison. It's a real pleasure. Now, I'm going to start with a bit of a personal question, which is a little bit odd for me. It's quite rare. I don't typically do this. But I'd love to know what we should know about you that then determined why you are a geopolitical analyst. Is there any connection there? I mean, I think, uh, you know, I grew up all over the world, lived in a lot of different places. Uh, I was originally born in Yugoslavia. That fell apart, went to the Middle East, then Europe, then Canada, and then the U.S. And I think what's very important about that kind of a background is that it gives you a, uh, maybe not an objective way to look at things, but at least there's no real home bias when you don't really have a home. So I think that's a benefit. Obviously, geopolitics is crucial to any investment strategy, at least, at least now. It wasn't a few decades ago, was it? But how do you sort of explain why this is such a crucial part of any investor's strategy to your clients like hedge funds? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, hedge funds, you know, very short term, uh, focusing on the couple of weeks, maybe a month at the most. Lots of opportunities to short or long the market or assets based on uh, events. It's very event-driven business. Now, longer term, investors, institutional investors, are really thinking about geopolitics as the base layer of a pyramid of asset allocation. It's ultimately what creates the macro context that will determine growth, productivity, inflation. These things are connected to politics and geopolitics, and we just seem to have forgotten that over the last 40 years. Obviously, you're biased, so I think I know what you're going to say here, but do you believe that that's actually more important when it comes to investing, is understanding the macro? You know, what I would say is that it's always been extremely important. It's just that for 40 years, after about 1985, geopolitics and politics worked as a tailwind for investors. So it was ignored, and, it, and many confused the tailwind with not being relevant. But um, if you really think about why we had such a long period of what was called the Great Moderation, it really came down to a victory on the domestic front by the Reagan and the Thatcher Revolution, the supply side in the 1980s. And of course, then the big geopolitical victory by the United States uh, on the geopolitical front against the Soviet Union. Those two tailwinds are gone. They've dissipated. We're in a completely different world. Um, but it doesn't mean that geopolitics didn't matter before. It just worked in the favor of investors, so they didn't pay attention to it. What's your framework for understanding macro and then applying that to a market strategy? You know, it's, uh, it's very simple. Uh, I think policymakers, politicians, leaders, authoritarian dictators, whatever you want to call them, um, they're far less relevant. You know, um, they are really tragic characters in the play of geopolitics. And they're constrained by material reality that surrounds them. So if you want to forecast what's going to happen in an event, you should focus on that material reality that forces a policymaker to do sometimes something that they don't want to do, something that goes against their ideology, against their beliefs, against their previous statements. You know, uh, politics is really all about the art of figuring out the path of least resistance, and policy often follows that path. Uh, now, this is very difficult to do in practice. Obviously, it doesn't work all the time. I call it a framework. It's not a theory. It's not a method. It's often wrong. But it does give investors something to start with rather than just kind of like throwing darts on the wall. Do you have sort of one rule that you always come back to when you're analysing, say, a ge geopolitical event like a conflict? I mean, is it like, you know, don't invest in a destabilised state or, you know, avoid what politicians are saying? Do you have sort of one motto, I guess you could say? 
I think uh, there's a couple. One of them is that um, the market almost always overestimates the half-life of geopolitical risk. In other words, the time that it will take for the risk to dissipate from the market. Um, and so what this means is that it's very difficult to tell an investor what to do ahead of an event, whether it's Brexit, election in the US, Russian decision to invade Ukraine. Those are difficult forecasts to make. But once they happen, they're almost never as bad as advertised. You know, that's almost a rule of thumb. So the way to really invest is to go against the hysteria once a negative geopolitical risk is taking place. Now, that's very difficult to do. It takes a lot of, um, you know, meditation and control to be able to go against all the scary headlines. Uh, but, you know, that's kind of a rule that's almost, almost never failed. Can you give me an example and let's use the most prominent current one, which would be the war in Ukraine? Yeah, that's a great question because it's such a great uh, example of this framework uh, in action. I mean, look, uh, my framework would have said and did, you know, I, I, I signed a pretty low probability to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So that was a huge error of the constraint framework, uh, largely because it is a really bad idea to do that. I mean, you we could spend the next 30 minutes going over all the reasons why invading a country the size of Ukraine is a really bad idea for Russia. Uh, but President Putin followed his preferences. He, did, he ignored his constraints. Once that happened, it was very easy to just abandon the framework and say, oh my God, Putin is difficult to analyze and forecast. This will lead to nuclear war. But in fact, those constraints didn't go anywhere. The material reality was still there. It was still a bad idea. And so a lot of the market reaction in terms of commodity appreciation in particular was overstating the risk because the invasion was a mistake. Russia was always going to basically lose in their initial objectives and focus on a much smaller part of Ukraine that for the global markets wasn't as relevant. And that's why the correct investment uh, thesis was actually to short a lot of the assets they had appreciated um, as the invasion started. So oil, commodities, wheat, they all basically collapsed after the invasion. Did you short them for your clients? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we advised in May that uh, our clients should short commodities broadly. Um, that was the correct call, except for oil. Oil took a couple of months to be convinced. And so in June, we just sent a note saying like, listen, we are really convinced that the war in Ukraine will have no impact on oil. In fact, it will have a bearish impact on oil because the sanctions against Russia are largely a PR effort. Russia is still pumping the same amount of oil but at a reduced price. Why is that bullish for oil? And so, yes, we did. How many people told you you were crazy when you came out with that call? Well, it depends. It depends. A lot of the clients I work with are very sophisticated. You know, they will, they will listen. They won't say you're crazy. Twitter definitely told me that I was crazy. And I took that as a badge of honor and then felt more convicted to do exactly what I said. I bet you probably gained some Twitter followers at least now. So at least that worked out for you. I hope so. <laughs> well, if you look at what's happening with the, the Russia and U Ukraine conflict now, there was a coup attempt against Putin. It's now ultimately failed. Did you predict that? And, and, and what would you say the sort of market calls are now with how the conflict has eventuated? Yeah, so, I mean, destabilization of Russia was pretty much the forecast that my team and I, we made literally the day after the invasion. You know, when, when policymakers do something against their material constraints, their, their time in power is doomed. Um, and so we set the clock right away. Um, and yes, we, we mentioned the word mutiny or a coup as a possibility. So I wasn't really surprised by that, but that's kind of irrelevant. What's relevant for investors right now is that there doesn't have to be a lot of political destabilization in Russia for it to be relevant. Why? Well, because in the 1990s, you know, Yeltsin held on for power for basically a decade. So he wasn't ever removed. He never lost the election. Um, and yet there was considerable political dysfunction in the country, which led to the halving, halving of Russian oil exports. They basically fell by half. I mean, it was incredible. And this is something that we should remember uh, for today's um, context as well. If there is continued political dysfunction in Russia, 
it will impact their ability to produce commodities, which are very important for the global economy. And so, you know, what I'm telling clients right now is that it's difficult for me to time when this happens. But given everything else going on around the world, which requires a lot of commodities, I think destabilization in Russia is yet another pillar of this kind of commodity super cycle. If we focus on commodities, then obviously OPEC and its decisions has a sort of large factor in all of this pricing as well. So how do you weight events like that? Because it seems like the market weights what OPEC does and says more than a conflict in Ukraine. Well, I mean, and that's been correct because the conflict in Ukraine has not impacted oil supply in any way. I think the conflict in Ukraine will continue to be largely irrelevant for the market. Um, what happens in, inside Russia, the politics of OPEC, those are far more relevant. And so I agree with the market that it's focusing on those other issues. I, I think another issue to think about in terms of oil is that as oil prices rise, there is a paradox. Uh, as oil prices rise, you know, some of the Russian oil barrels are being priced above the price cap set by the sanctions. But once they rise above that price cap, no tanker wants to fill up with Russian oil and send it to the rest of the world. And so we have this perverse incentive set in place by these sanctions against Russia, which means that as oil prices rise, we lose potentially considerable amounts of Russian supply. And so that is likely going to cause an overshoot in oil prices over the next six months. Outside of oil, when you look at everything that's happening in the world across all markets, what is your next big prediction? Is it perhaps about China, maybe? You know, what I would say is um, China is its own world. You know, I, I don't want to call it emerging markets, but what I would say is that Chinese policymakers eventually are going to be forced by their material constraints to put a floor in growth. So I'm not too excited about China. I just think China will not be suicidal and, you know, they'll, they'll put some sort of a floor. But a bigger picture for me is emerging markets. So countries outside of China, whether it's Indonesia, whether it's Vietnam, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, countries in Latin America in particular, the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, these countries are likely going to ride the wave of what's going around the world, which is this incredible capital investment cycle that's been started by onshoring, reshoring, French shoring, enemy shoring, whatever shoring, um, U.S. households, which are absolutely filled with savings, with deposits from the fiscal stimulus in 2021. This is starting to look to be like the 20, 2002 to 2008 cycle, uh, which was quite different from what we've lived through the last 10 years, which is subpar growth, subpar inflation, you know, you want to really own U.S. tech and bonds. That was what worked last decade. I think that this decade will resemble more than 2002 to 2007. And that's not really on anybody's radar. And if it is, there's a lot of doubt that emerging markets are a place to be. In fact, the dollar's rising now. Emerging markets are now doing very well. So it's a counterintuitive thesis, but I think it will play out over the next five years. That's interesting because a lot of analysts that I speak to think that we're currently in the midst of the end of globalisation, but you just think it's the end of globalisation as we know it and it's just a new wave of other markets that are going to join it. Is that a good way to phrase it? I think it's too simplistic to say it's the end of globalisation. Uh, I think it's the end of uh, you know hyper-efficient globalisation that we had in the 90s and the 2000s. But ironically, you know, Madison, if we are going to unwind this hyper-efficient supply chain globalized network that we've, we've done, what do you need to, to do that? What do you need to uh, unwind it? Well, you need a lot of capital investment goods, primarily commodities, and emerging markets produce those. So I think that commodity producing emerging markets are going to do well, whether China and the US are trading as much as they did 10 years ago or not. So I take it that you're watching BRICS pretty closely? What did you make of its recent additions? Yeah, so I think I am, I'm definitely watching uh, very closely what's going on in those economies. I think the grouping itself is, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit of anachronism. Uh, I mean, you know, tip of the hat to Jim O'Neill of Goldman Sachs, who of course invented the term BRICS. I think it's the dream of any investment strategist to one day become geopolitically relevant, that your acronym becomes geopolitically relevant. But I think the grouping itself is less relevant than what's going on in those economies individually. And uh, almost all of them, other than China, are doing really well. Uh, South Africa also has uh, some problems, especially institutional. Uh, but the RAND is so cheap right now that I can even see South African uh, assets doing quite well 
in a capital investment heavy cycle. You're pretty much always looking for opportunity and value to be had out of conflict, I guess you could say. Do you think it's possible to make money in a time of peace if we ever see one? Well, I think we are in a time of peace. I think uh, those that think that we're in time of war, you know, I mean, it can always get a lot worse. And so um, there is the, the greatest number of conflicts going on right now since the Second World War. That's actually a data set by Uppsala University in Sweden. So, you know, we can chart the number of conflicts going on. Um, but we're nowhere near sort of total war or war between uh, great powers. But the state of conflict or state of competition is not necessarily bad. Uh, we've seen great technological innovation emerge out of the Cold War race between US and the Soviet Union or the multipolar world uh, that preceded World War I. So this kind of a state of conflict, of competition, of national security issues is not necessarily bad because it can produce considerable incentives for governments to get involved in spurring on meaningful technological innovation, you know, more meaningful than what we had come out of Silicon Valley for much of the last decade, which, quite frankly, is not that meaningful. It sounds like you don't really care about the tensions between the East and West. Is that fair to say? I I, I do care. I think they're very, very important. I just think that a lot of the U.S.-China um, conflict, I think, first of all, is incorrectly being painted as a Cold War 2.0. I think it is laughably, uh, you know, the, the comparison is laughable. I mean, the two countries are nowhere near as powerful as the U.S. and the Soviet Union were in comparison with the rest of the world during the Cold War. And that's very important because other countries do matter today. The other issue is that, you know, China's peak before it even really had a chance to compete with the US. China has some really, really long-term secular problems, whether it's demographics, whether it's the fact that its households are deeply leveraged. Uh, China's facing the kind of a decade of secular stagnation that the United States faced from 2009 to 2020. So I think that um, you know, China-US competition is important, but what I would tell investors and also policymakers is don't obsess about it. There's going to be incredible opportunities and also risks outside of that axis. And that's the reason I ask. So where should we look to obsess instead, if not those tensions? You know, I think the biggest tensions have maybe nothing to do with geopolitics. I would say that we're looking at a, a, a wrong discipline. I think politics, domestic politics, are the source of almost all the tensions going on around the world, particularly here in the U.S., where... Uh, combination of very elevated income inequality and very poor social mobility, at least by American standards, is creating a real social tension that American policymakers don't really know how to resolve. So what they've done is they've used palliatives. They've used these sort of uh, temporary solutions, whether it's gargantuan fiscal stimulus during COVID, as an example, you know, abandonment of orthodoxy from the Reagan and Thatcher revolutions. Uh, incredible fiscal deficits uh, during, you know, time of economic prosperity. So these are problems that I think um, are really going to strain the U.S. The other solution policymakers in the U.S. have done outside of this kind of populist macro policies is also aggressive geopolitical competition with China, trying to resolve domestic uh, polarization through external conflict. I think that's perhaps the biggest risk for investors over the next five years. And quite frankly, many of my clients who manage long-term capital are starting to ask questions they never ask about the U.S., such as, if I hold this 10-year treasury, will I ever get repaid? I mean, or will the U.S. simply inflate it away? Are you watching what's happening in New Zealand society and politics at all, Marco? Absolutely. I mean, New Zealand has been, uh, in many ways, uh, one of the sort of canaries in the coal mine for, for the West in many ways. What I love about you is that you talk about such negative problems, but in such an optimistic manner. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much for your time, Marco. Absolutely, Madison. It's a pleasure.
Marco does have some clients in New Zealand and comes to Auckland about once a year. So we'll catch up when he's back and film another interview in person. Now, this was a bit of a different style of interview for my show. Typically, it's interviews with CEOs and analysts. But I thought this conversation would be good to give you insight into how to apply different frameworks to your investment strategy. So let me know if you found it helpful or not. Now go put your money to work. Thanks for watching Markets with Madison, the New Zealand Herald show for interested investors. If you want to stay up to date with financial markets, click the subscribe button below and you can watch our other episodes here. Stay up to date with all the business news and numbers as they land on nzherald.co.nz.